This podcast is brought to you by Chapelure Media. Does your website need an update? Is social media working for your business? If you need digital media help, Chapelure Media is here for you. Web design, social media, graphics, digital strategy. They do that. Visit chapeloremedia.com to find out more. Welcome to The Dots, a podcast about connecting. The Dots is a series of conversations with artists, community leaders, entrepreneurs, and changemakers who talk about how they connect the dots and bring things together for their communities, companies, and themselves for a better life. And now your host, digital strategist, speaker, and entrepreneur, Kathleen Butchko. Joffrey McClung is a spiritual, personal growth author and teacher, an inspirational blogger, a self-love advocate, and an independent filmmaker. She began her career as a theater actress in New York City. Being someone who never waited for permission to do anything, including nuclear disasters, which we just found out about, (laughs) she'll quickly put on her producing hat when auditioning was taking a backseat to performing, and then she mounted several off-Broadway productions, and she acted in them as well. But with two close deaths, she began a new path as a spiritual healer, and Joffrey is going to share that path with us today. Welcome to the Dots, Joffrey. Well, thanks for having me, Kathleen. I'm thrilled to be here with you. I am too. Um, So tell me a little bit about your journey. Uh, Where'd you grow up? Well, I grew up in Texas, Fort Worth, Texas, your basic suburban life. My dad was a lawyer. My mom was an artist, uh, you know, in the home. But then she started publishing his law books. Uh, she literally stood behind the printing press and published, wow. literally printed the books in the beginning. And we put them together around the pool table. Eventually, they got a printer, uh, <laughs> a professional printer to do it. And then I went to school at uh, Austin at UT, uh, majored in theater with a minor in government. There was a part of me that wanted to be a lawyer. Was producing all those law books in around the pool table. Oh yeah, and just that 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 need to that I, I like the argument, uh, learning how to argue, not fight, but really how to argue. How a lawyer argues, I like that. And the civil rights was going on, and the women's rights. So there was a part of me that wanted to go into that area. But I have to say, theater was my love. So I majored in theater, and then uh, right after I graduated, I went right to New York. Didn't know anyone there. Didn't know anything about it, but I had known uh, since I was little. I always laugh and say there's there's been like two driving forces and then one reoccurring pattern that's responsible for the direction of my life and basically why I find myself here today talking to you. And the first driving force was I wanted to be out in the world. I wanted to participate in the world. I want to be part of the world and have an impact on the world. And I remember being eight years old and announced I was watching some you know old classic movie on TV, uh, black and white, and they were in New York having just the glorious time. And I remember turning to everybody saying, I I'm going to be moving there and being an actress. I will not be getting married and moving to the suburbs. I don't know why I knew that at eight years old, but somehow I already knew that was going to be my life path. But that's important, right? That's, you know, there are these seminal things that happen when you're a child Mm -hmm. that you know. And I think that so many people sometimes go, no, no, that was just a kid talking. They blow it off. Yeah. And I think my parents blew it off until, like I said, I graduated and said, I'm going to New York now. And they were like, what? (laughs) I said, I meant it when I said it, people. (laughs) Take me as my word. The second, uh, the second driving force that I was looking back uh, when we were going to have our interview, I thought, you know, I wanted to mention this is, is I also had this other force that I wanted to understand the nature of life. I wanted to to know why. Why is the world the way it is? You know, why are we here? What what are we here to do? I was always fascinated by the esoteric spiritual questions. And I was lucky enough to have parents who were willing to let me question everything. So when I look back now and think, boy, I was really lucky. I could question anything and everything. And they let me do it. So those two driving forces really were helpful for me. And then that reoccurring pattern I talked about that was sort of set me up for life was this pattern of me almost always having to do everything myself. That's that inner producer. Or I used to say it's that inner Zigfield because it started out as a producer wanting to put on a show. I was always ready to put on a show. There you go. You got the follies right behind you. 
Oh, yeah. I just, anything, even in high school, I put on a dance. We, we had nothing to do one summer. I said, well, let's put on a dance. You know, it's like, put on a show. That, uh, everything, that recurring pattern, having to do it myself and finding myself alone a lot, you know, being in a new city in New York, not knowing anyone, having to entertain myself, explore myself, get my own apartment, get my own job. I had to start relying on myself, which now that I look back and here I'm a self love advocate and teacher, I realize, well, the best way to find out about yourself is to be with yourself you know uh so that those well and that's an extraordinary amount of um passion but also courage right i look to kind of our young people today who you know are graduating from college and you know they they feel like they have to fill out the resume and put it online and talk to their linkedin contacts and You know, there's something to be said for I'm packing up the Pinto and I'm going to New York. Yeah. And there's something to be said about not following every rule always, because I remember them saying, well, you have to do it this way. You have to go and you have to have this before you go. Well, you know what? Synchronicity happens when you just let it happen. I went to New York and I arrived there during the newspaper strike. Good Lord. I mean, (laughs) I didn't know anything about New York and I had to find an apartment. There was a newspaper strike. So how was I going to find an apartment? So a lot of times you just have to be willing to say, this is what I want to do. Maybe it's not about getting online and checking every answer out before I know and saying, you know, I'm willing to trust. I'm willing to trust that I can handle it. I did always have that, that I could handle it. And I think it was that time on my own, being uh, having to do everything in a way for myself. That really gave me a sense of courage. Uh, and we need a lot of that, I think, versus looking for everybody to do something for you. I think we need a lot more of that. And of course, self-love is part of that. So let's talk about, you know, self-love. How do you define that? Well, I define it quite simply in the book so that people could remember it, number one, because I I take the three components and then I break it down and we work on that because it's really a book about redefining love and working with the energy of love. Now, I know love is a word people kind of go, oh, she's going to go there. Well, you know, it's an important (laughs) word, people. (laughs) It really is an energy that does transform. So it's not just a pretty word. But um, self-love, the way I... Stamps that say love. There's T-shirts. That's a pretty word. It's a beautiful word, and it's a powerful <laughs> word. I mean, we need a lot more of it. Frankly, there's a lot of bullying going on that we need a lot more loving. Uh, but self-love is knowing in your heart. That's key. That it has to be rooted in your heart. It's not just a mental concept. You see a lot of people walking around with a lot of bravado. That does not mean they're rooted in self-love. And frankly, that tends to mean they're not. Um, and we see a lot of that these days. Uh, It's a knowing in your heart that your very being, again, perhaps your personality at times isn't so so lovable, (laughs) but your very being is lovable, loving, and loved. That way you can remember lovable, loving, and loved. Now, what does that mean to be lovable? Lovable means you're worthy of love. Your beingness, the fact you're here, you're worthy of love. You don't need to go out and earn it. You don't need to get it from somebody else. You are worthy of love, period. Uh, You don't have to prove it to anybody. Loving means that you have a a natural benevolence in your heart. And the way you express that benevolence is good enough. You are good enough in your expressing of your loving, whether it's in relationships or in your creativity or career. You're good enough. How you express it is good enough. And then the third part, loved, means you are valued. You matter just as you are. Again, you don't need to go and prove it and get it from outside of yourself. You matter and you're valued. So you're worthy, you're valuable, and you matter, and you're good enough. Those are the components of self-love. Now, once you have those, you can pretty much handle any challenge that comes to you. You really can. So let's talk about that. How do you handle those challenges? Oh, Lord, no. I certainly have had my share. Sometimes those dark nights are a blessing, I have to say. I've had two of them. Uh, first one got me started on the, on the path and the third one, uh, the second one, uh, I finished up my homework on self-love. So when you have a challenge, first of all, realize that the challenge is not going to be forever. So at least give that to yourself, be loving to yourself in that sense. This is not going to last forever. And that's terrifying people. It is. And I've faced that myself where you're suddenly in, like you say, that dark night. And you cannot see a light at the end of the tunnel. Oh, no. Oh, no. There is no light. Frankly, there is no light. It's like, oh, my God, it's dark. It's, you know, pitch black in here. Yeah. So I think the first step is to really, and you're going to have to tell yourself that a lot. You're going to have to do a lot of self-talking. And I know people think that's weird, but you're you're actually self-talking all the time. Unfortunately, it tends to be negative. 
<laughs> you know, so you're already doing it. So let's put some positive in there. So tell yourself, first of all, this is not going to last forever. This is temporary. So at least it gives you room to breathe that there's hope. Even if you can't see it, there's hope because everything changes. So if you have to use that mantra, everything changes. So this too will change. That got me through, you know, helped me to keep going through my homework with it. Then use the challenge to get to know yourself. You're wide open. Challenges tend to break us wide open. We are like raw emotions. So that mask we wear to show others and really to ourselves is gone because we are wide open. So don't be so fast to put a Band-Aid on it. Ten, people tend to want to get out of it really quick if there's a challenge, meaning the pain. Sometimes the challenge takes time. You have to get a new job. You got to look for a new job. But the pain you're feeling about losing a job and having to find a new one, people want to rush out of it uh, and get out of it. Well, use it because you can learn a lot about yourself. So use your challenge to learn about yourself. And the third thing I would say about challenge, and these are quick things, obviously, there's a lot of things you can do, but is use your imagination. Guys, we have an imagination for a reason and we use it pretty much every day. But like I said, we use it in a negative sense. We constantly think about the worst case scenarios. What could go wrong? What if the car breaks down? What if I don't get that job? What if he leaves me? What if she leaves me? We use our imagination so much, but in a negative way. When you're in a challenge, obviously your imagination is going to be activated to go to that negative route. I say start practicing and it's going to take practice. Things that matter take practice. Use your imagination to start loving yourself a little bit. So if you're feeling like when I'm in a dark night, one of my emotions I tend to go through is a sense of what I call existential loneliness. I feel like I am all alone in the universe, that I don't matter. Nobody knows that I'm going through this. Universe doesn't care. I'm on my own. Yeah. That is kind of my go-to when I'm in a dark night or when I'm in fear, real fear. I tend to get that existential loneliness. So I imagine, I close my eyes, you can do it any way you want. And I imagine being surrounded with love. Now, sometimes it's arms wrapped around me. Sometimes I'll be in nature and I'll literally go up to a tree and hug it in my mind because nature's loving to me. To so somebody else, it might not be. But I start to imagine loving, loving images so that I begin to get into that. You imagine what you imagine, you start to feel. So it calms you down and you're not going to that worst case scenario. So I'd say use your imagination, remind yourself that things always change. This is not going to be ever. And use it to observe yourself. What's not working in yourself right now? That's what I would do with challenge. There's a lot more you're going to do with the challenge in the book. It talks a lot about it, but that's kind of an easy thing for people to grab hold of. And the imagination is so key. So key. Your imagination can, can get the best of you. Oh God. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm an only child, so I've been talking to myself forever. Oh yeah. And, and, you know, because you're only, you're the only one, no matter how close you are to your family, your parents, they're in a different time space continuum, right? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> They're totally in a different universe than you are. Yeah. And that's even true, really, even of siblings. Uh, you really are. Everyone has that feeling, Kathleen, you're not alone in that just because you're an only child. I have a sibling, but I'm telling you, I too found that I had talked to myself. And I think everybody does, and they just don't say it. You know, and I, and I think that's, you know, kind of when you talk about coming out of the spiritual closet, you just come out of the closet and say, you know, I have been speaking to myself for a very long time. And it hasn't always been very charitably. No, exactly. It has it hasn't not been, been the best my, friend. where I should have been my own best friend. Exactly. And that's what I'm saying. We do that. And sometimes we're not even aware. Of, I'm aware when I'm telling myself bad things like, oh my God, you know, I did that so wrong. They're going to know I'm not good enough for this. Those I catch. But those little quieter ones in the background of just that chatter, that mind chatter, negativity, people are very unaware of that. So you're already talking to yourself, people. So you're already, if you think that's loony, you're already on the loony bin. So you might as well yeah. use that self-talk and start saying, well, if I'm going to talk to myself, I'm at least going to be nice to myself and kind to myself. And do I need some nurturing? Do I need to remind myself, my God, you're doing a great job under all this stress, you know, having some compassion, some acceptance, be your own best friend. You just said it. Do you need a web host? We love Bluehost. 24-7 US-based support. Money back guarantees. WordPress made easy. Head to our website, thedotspodcast.com and click on any Bluehost box to get Bluehost as your web host and get a discount when you sign up. Bluehost, just the help you need. In the book, we talk about meditation. I tell people meditation is simply focusing your attention, people. You don't need to chant. You don't need to light tons of candles. You don't need to sit in a position. 
that's all you know, window dressing as far as I'm concerned. I'm big on common sense stuff. Meditations, you're going to sit down, close your eyes, because you. for me, I need to close my eyes, otherwise my mind goes somewhere else. And you're just going to focus your attention. And then when you add imagination, like we, what we just said, if you're in pain or you're in fear, you start to imagine a safe space, it calms you down. We should be teaching kids this, frankly. I mean, kids, and actually they are starting to teach kids meditation, how to calm themselves with images. So so it's time to use our imagination for the good. Yeah, it's We so have true. it for a reason. It's so true because I, I spent some time working with a nonprofit that um, – had families in recovery surviving domestic violence. And mm, mm. we found the way candidly to break that generational cycle of violence was to begin to teach the kids to take care of their own self, to yes. be comfortable in their own skin, to love themselves independent of anyone else. Anyone else and self nurture to learn how to self nurture yourself. What do you need? What does it feel yeah. like? Versus people, adults tend to because they figure it's too late. They've learned everything. That's not true because, like I said, I'm still growing. But uh, that's most people think self nurturing. Well, I'm going to go and go buy an outfit, or I'm going to go. Oh, I'll go hit the gym double hard today, or I'm going to go to the spa. You know, they do something. They think that's nurturing. Nurturing is really when you're in that fear, or like you said with with the domestic violence, learning how when you're feeling that that sense of loneliness. Which I'm sure those kids were feeling very yes. alone um, and frightened and powerless to be able to nurture yourself. So what are the images that bring that to you to start to understand yourself is to understand what feels good to me, what really feels like love. In other words, you're going to redefine love for yourself and start to give it to yourself. It was always fascinating to me because some of the work that this organization had done had started 40 years ago when this approach was not popular at all. And mm -hmm. meeting kids who had grown up and gone on and done other things, but came back to, uh, to either give back or to share their stories with the families. And it was always astonishing to me how many of those kids would come back and say, I became my own best friend. And that helped oh, yes, me when yes. I was in graduate school, or that helped me when I became a police officer. And that helped me. And you began to see how these tiny, tiny seeds of self-love and of really realizing it's okay to be happy. And okay mm -hmm. to be happy, not by comparing yourself to someone external, but by building your own self up. And I think that, you know, as Americans, we've grown up in this society that says you're successful because I compare myself to Joffrey and, you know, I got, I got it going because I'm living 5,000 miles away. <laughs> right. Some type of, right. Or I'm making right, more money or I'm doing this. Artificial or construct that we've convinced ourselves is the actual meaning of life. Well, it's that whole thing of looking for your validation, whether it's your worth or your value or your matter or whatever it is, or even your your sense of, of nurturing, because that's a mat. If you matter, you're nurturing. You nurture yourself if you matter, and the universe will nurture you. Um, outside of yourself, so you look for that success, that those feelings. Oh, well, when I'm successful, then I'll know I'm I'm valuable. There's a lot of that. I was talking about those that driving force earlier, the two driving forces. Those were my positive driving forces. The um, wh why, why are we here, the big questions, and then wanting to participate and be impactful on the world positively. I also had a negative driving force, which I think people need to look at as well. It's one of those secrets to self-love I talk about. Um, that negative driving force was, well, when I'm successful, then they'll know they should have been nice to me. Then they'll know they should have appreciated me then. It, and I realized I had said that to myself. That was my first clue. Well, I, I have to be grateful to myself that I, I did catch it. In my late 20s, I went, boy, why is that? Why are you saying that? <laughs> you know? Then they'll love me. Then I'll be yeah. lovable, in other words. Then I'll be worthy of love because then I'm successful. And we do a lot of that. And women do a lot of that, too, especially uh, when uh, the children are well or when the husband or when this job or everything's outside of themselves because they're the caretakers right. in a sense. So it's all about when all that's cared for, then my value, my worth. I call it kind of that martyr syndrome of, um, you know, I'll do all this for everybody and then I'll get rewarded with that sense that I'm valuable and then I matter. Well, I say you've got it backwards. You need to have that first. And then do it for everyone else. You need to do it for yourself first. I think that's first. very, very valuable so advice, especially for women, because we have a tendency, to your point, put our 
career ahead of us. Our our partner, significant other, our husband, our wife, and then this will get to me. My children, my community, mm-hmm. my everything external to ourselves. And Come on, that's, that's how we're raised. Our our purpose is if we're to take care of everything outside of ourselves. But not ourselves. But not ourselves. But it's okay to take care of yourself. And it's... Oh, it's imperative. If you really want to be a loving person and be impactful to others, you need to do it for yourself first. Because if you're compassionate with yourself, Kathleen, you're going to offer that compassion to others. Because when you've forgiven yourself for your stumbles, how much easier is to forgive others for their stumbles? So really, everything you're willing to give to yourself is so much easier than to give to others. So if people think it's selfish, I'll wait and I'll do it later. No, I'm telling you, you've got it backwards. Do it now. And then your impact on others are gonna, is going to be much more impactful and much more loving and much more positive. So, Jeffrey, what motivates you at this point? Self-love motivates me. i got to be honest with you. Now that I know and I feel my worth and value and sense of being good enough, and I know it no matter what happens, no matter what I own or what I am or what my title is, I kind of now want to see what I'm capable of creating from that energy instead of that energy of needing to be validated or to prove my worth to somebody. So this is kind of new territory because all of this is new within the last five, six, seven years, you know. So I sort of want to see what I'm going to personally create from that. And then out of that, I also do have this driving thing of wanting to help other people understand the importance of self-love. I want it to become common sense, a common sense way of living so that it's not some woo-woo-y thing that only, you know, people who spiritual or good Lord, new agers only talk about. No, it's common sense. Uh, I, I mean, even Gandhi talked, all our sages have talked about, you know, uh, change yourself first, then the world. It all starts with the self. So I would like that to be common sense and to talk about it in a common sense way. So it's less esoteric to people. So that's kind of my driving force is how do I do that? I'm not sure, Kathleen. I'm a work in progress, if I, you don't mind me saying. Um, so I'm hoping that that's somehow going to start to happen. And I do know that what motivates me now is I love the writing. But I'm really that performer's wanting to come out, meaning I want to speak more. So I want to start to talk more and speak more. That's that that part of that performer wants to says, OK, I've been quiet now. You went through your dark night. You healed yourself. Now, then you wrote. That's great. Your voice came alive. Now we need to speak. So I think that's going to be part of my driving force as well. But it's going to be for good. It's going to be about self-love, self-awareness, because that's one of the keys to self-love is you've got people got to wake up, become self-aware of their impact on others. People, right. no, absolutely. <laughs> we all have impact. You know, we're seeing all this bullying and negative stuff going on. Uh, that really is from the lack of self-love and people's lack of self-awareness of their impact. Because I think most people are good in their hearts. And if they really knew their impact, they would be appalled. I really do think that. I think that's a, I think that's a, that's a, an astonishing statement because as as we truly look across the world and we had a little bit of a brief talk before this is Mm -hmm. if you are self-aware, you certainly can love yourself, but understand the impact that you're going to have on others. And in having that impact, truly try and make it the best impact possible. Oh yeah. Because that's the cool thing about self-love. People think it's so esoteric, but the truth of the matter is when you experience that self-love, that nurturing, that compassion, that acceptance, all the different flavors of self-love, all of a sudden you really want to move through the world and offer that love to everybody else. That's not something I set out to do. I set out to heal myself and set out to get those voices to be quiet that I was good enough, you know, all those gifts to myself. So I wasn't set out to say, I'm going to go out there and talk about love to everybody. That wasn't part of my game plan, Kathleen, at all. (laughs) It wasn't on my script of what I was going to do. (laughs) But after I did the self-love, suddenly I thought, well, I want my friends. So I I talked to friends about it because I wanted them to experience that feeling. So I was very loving with them and helped guide them to find their self-love. And to realize it's going to be constantly growing the rest of your life. It's a journey, people. But that's the thing. Once you have that, you really become much more loving to other people. And your impact, you realize, boy, I was just snappy. And you are quick to catch it. And you're quick to say, you know what? I'm so sorry I was snappy with you. You know why I was? And nothing to do with you. You know, I'm tense over here because I had this over here to do and I, I'm behind and I'm so sorry. You really own your impact. It's fabulous. Really is fabulous. Self-awareness is a good thing. It's scary at first because you realize, ooh, I behaved kind of badly. Yeah. You know? yeah. 
And but once you get through it and realize, well, I did that because I was in such pain and I didn't like myself. Oh, okay. I practice compassion. Then when you you know you go out there, you're much kinder with people. Much kinder. It's a natural byproduct. Didn't know it, but I'm glad for it. Jeffrey, I'm glad that you are able to share this kind of new common sense of self-love with us and, and really help us connect the dots. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Kathleen. It's been absolutely a delight as usual with you. Thank you. The Dots is produced by Chapelure Media. Follow The Dots Podcast on our website at thedotspodcast.com. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, and see how all of The Dots connect on our Instagram account. Please subscribe and review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you tune into your favorite shows. This podcast is part of the Chapelure Media Network.